Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course. This module is on network technologies. I'm James Messer. And in this module, we're going to learn all about a bunch of different kinds of networking technologies from our 220-701 section 4.1 exam, where we need to understand the basics of networking fundamentals. And there's a lot behind what's happening on the network, not just in the communication that's going back and forth, but in the ways and the devices that we're using to communicate. We're going to go through all of that and much more in this module. Before we get into what all of these devices are and all of these methods of communicating, let's talk about what a network is. We've already done a few modules now on networking, but what really is a network? At the end of the day, it's how we connect all of these different devices together. They have to be able to communicate over some method. Sometimes that's a copper wire. Sometimes it's fiber optics. Sometimes it's wirelessly. We don't even technically have to be physically connected to another device these days. The way that we determine how we're communicating is over a topology. And a topology is just a simple network type. For Ethernet, we refer to these as Ethernet networks. These are IEEE 802.3 networks. You hear this IEEE term used a lot with wireless, where we talk about 802.11 wireless networks. What that's referring to is a, a group of very smart people at the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers that came up with a standardized way to communicate down at that electrical level. Being able to communicate from one device to another requires a lot of detailed technical information so that every machine is able to communicate in exactly the same way. And the IEEE came up with these very standardized formats, and that allows us to be able to communicate and use these topologies exactly the same. Whether you have a laptop or a desktop computer or any other device, they can talk on those networks and talk very perfectly between all of those different devices. The network now is just built into the operating system. This wasn't always the case with other operating systems years and years ago. There were no networking components. You had to add on or install different modules. You had to install specific hardware. These days, you don't even exactly know where the network stops and the operating system begins. And in a way, that makes it much easier for us. Our computers these days, the network port's just part of it. It comes with it. It's right there on the motherboard. There's a couple of Ethernet ports on the back of this server motherboard that's down here on the bottom right. So we don't even think about it anymore. We don't even have to purchase networking software. We don't have to purchase extra networking cards unless we really want them. In most cases, they're already included with our computer. The wireless technology is already built in. We don't even have to think about it. Networking is really about connecting devices together. And on our common networks that we use, there's a couple of different ways to do this. One of the most easiest and most common ways is with Ethernet. You take a wire, you plug it in. It's usually a copper wire. It's what we use in our large infrastructures to connect devices at high speeds, whether it's a router or it's a firewall or it's a switch or a printer or a server or whatever it happens to be. You really find Ethernet networks everywhere. It's hard to find a place that doesn't have an Ethernet network these days. The more popular kind of mobile networks these days are wireless networks. And usually these are the 802.11 type of wireless networks. There's also other types of wireless networks that are used in more mobile or cellular type environments. But in our, in our local areas, we use 802.11, whether it's an A, a B, a G, or an N flavored of 802.11. It's almost always you can find this in people's houses, in uh, large offices. There are security concerns associated with this particular networking type because it's going out over the air. It's like a radio station. Anybody with a radio can tune in. So you want to be sure if you are using a wireless network that you're putting the right security pieces in place to be able to protect and even encrypt the data going across those networks. Networks are also all about speed. You want to be able to transmit and communicate back and forth. And most networks have a particular speed that they run at. And you may decide which network you use based on the speed. You may want to plug into a copper Ethernet network instead of wireless because it gives you a higher amount of throughput. Sometimes the bandwidth becomes extremely important, especially if you're transferring very large files or you're performing very, very high speed functions. You need that speed. You also almost always see this described in bits per second. So your Ethernet network may be running at 100 megabits per second or 1 gigabit per second. It's always in bits per second as we describe these networking communications. Some of these topologies communicate at, in both directions at the same time. So my computer could be transmitting information out and at exactly the same time 
could be receiving information in. And that means that I have to have a topology and a network configuration that's able to do that. Wireless networks, for instance, can't do that. When I'm transmitting information, I'm overloading my local receiver. It can't receive information while I'm transmitting. So wireless networks tend to be half duplex, whereas Ethernet, copper, and fiber networks tend to run full duplex because that's the fastest efficiency that you can get. Half duplex is more like one person gets to talk at a time. While that station is transmitting, it can't receive anything. It has to stop transmitting before it can start receiving. And while it's receiving, it can't interrupt that with a transmit. So only one device can communicate one direction at a time on those half duplex networks. The duplex must match. So if you are on a copper network and you're communicating full duplex to a machine, the machine on the other end better be set up to receive that at full duplex as well if it's going to be able to send and receive at the same time. Otherwise, you may be trying to send information to a device while it's receiving information and the machine can't receive that. So it becomes very difficult if the duplex is mismatched, we call it. So you want to be sure that if you're communicating to a switch and that switch is set to full duplex, that you are also set to full duplex on your side. When you get into Windows networking, we even put a layer on top of all of that that says, are you communicating in a work group or are you communicating on a Windows domain? And you almost always are going to know the answer to this because there are very specific occasions when you would use these. In a Windows networking world, your system properties, you'll see your computer name there and then you'll also see whether you are connected to a work group or whether you are joining a domain. Now, work groups are always used in small environments. You don't have to have any extra hardware, no additional servers. There's no extra configurations to be part of a work group. And if you're in a small office or a home type environment, all of your machines, just put them on the same work group. Call it your home work group. Call it your house work group or whatever it happens to be. On our network, the work group is Pegasus. And my machine here is the Daedalus. So on my Pegasus work group, everybody here is in the Pegasus work group. And so any other machines that connect to my network are going to want to be on the Pegasus network. And that makes it easy for all of us to communicate to each other. If you're in a very large environment, a large enterprise, there almost always is a domain set up in those environments. And that's almost always created for management purposes. It allows the people managing all of your computers to manage them all from a central point. There are a lot of great advantages in large environments to having a domain configuration. But a domain configuration requires a very specialized server to be handling that centralized domain functionality. So you're never going to connect to a domain accidentally. It's always one that has been specifically set up for you. There's specific rights and permissions. And you have to actually get permission to join the domain by somebody who has the permissions to allow you to join the domain. You can't just show up at somebody's location and join the domain automatically. It is very specialized with very specific functionality. You just don't allow anyone to join in. So you'll be able to see if this was a domain, we would simply click our network ID and we'd add the domain in here. And the domain administrator would probably provide us with the right credentials so that our machine could be a member of that domain. Otherwise, you're almost always going to be in a work group and you need to decide to make sure all of the machines on your work group are using the same name as all of the others. If you're talking and communicating with devices that are in your home office or your small office or just your local enterprise network in a building, for instance, we call those local area networks. And it describes that we're able to communicate to all of these devices really without having to step outside the bounds of our network. There's also this concept of wide area networks or WANs. So the wide area network is one where you're usually using a third party to communicate. You're getting AT&T or Sprint involved. And they have internet connectivity. And we're connecting out through their cloud. That's why we often draw this as a cloud, because we really don't know what, what AT&T, we really don't know what Sprint is using on that wide area network. We're sending our traffic into it. And magically on the other side, they're providing us a link back on the other side. What happens in between, it's a mystery. Well, some of us know really what's going on in between, but the reality is we don't care. All we're doing is sending information into the cloud, and it magically comes out on the other side exactly the way that we've requested AT&T or Sprint or our wide area network provider to be able to do that. When we're going outside of our building, we're going outside of our local area network, we refer to that as a wide area network. And on the other end is another local area network. So you're almost always con connecting these different LANs with a WAN in between. So don't be thrown by those acronyms. We're really referring to a relative space where our local area networks and our wide area networks might be.